do that. Um, so, you know, I wanted to welcome everybody. My name is Craig Hardestine. I'm the board chair of Out on Film, um, and I'll let Jim introduce himself. Uh, I'm Jim Farmer, I'm the festival director. Um, I know some of you. I, I, I'm, I'm nice to be able to see a lot of you today. Thanks, thanks so much for doing this. This was sort of a, a harebrained idea I did. We, I came up with a couple of days ago. We, we were initially going to try and do um, live stream Q and A's for all of our shorts programs. It's like there, the, there's just no way. <laughs> there's absolutely no way we can do this. I thought it would just be good to bring some of us together first weekend and then just talk for a little bit and just sort of chat and you know just and just sort of see how everybody's doing. And, and so just so everybody knows who all's here, um, so we have invited shorts filmmakers who have already been in shorts programs that have already screened through the festival. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we do a lot of shorts programs. Um, and this year, I believe we have 16 yes. total. Um, so we are dropping at least one, maybe two shorts programs every day. And that's really to celebrate all of you. Um, for all of the work that you do, for all of the stories that you tell. Um, and we have also invited to join us because, as Jim was saying earlier, uh, we typically have a filmmaker brunch for all yeah. the people who are in town. Um, and obviously we can't do that this year, so we thought this might be the next best <laughs> alternative to doing an in-person brunch that we can get a, a lot of us together um, and chat. Um, we also, as oh, part of the festival, we have members who, who, who join the, the festival with us. And what we really wanted to do is provide an opportunity for them to join us this morning, um, you know, and hear about some of the work that you're doing, your films, and a lot of them have already seen your films. Um, as I've kind of obsessively watched what people are doing during the festival. So I know that people have watched your films. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to provide an opportunity where we could talk about your work. They could ask some questions and just hear about you. Um, and then some of our volunteers are here. And I am going to give out a shout out to Dennis, if you will wave to everybody. Uh, because Dennis is on our programming committee and I think is one of the people who've seen uh, almost everything almost as much as Jim has seen um, and QC'd everything. Um, and Josh, who as I saw on the screen here in the middle, um, who is also part of our team this year. Uh, and, and just really, you all know what the festival is like. It, it takes an army of people to kind of really pull all this together. Um, so what we just wanted to do is I'm just going to take a minute. Um, as I said earlier, if you've joined us as a filmmaker, if you want to type your name and your film into the chat. Um, for anybody else who's joined us from our members or our volunteers, if you want to ask questions, feel free. If you want to use the chat, feel free. Um, but what I kind of thought I would just start with... Um, Why don't we let everybody okay. introduce themselves. Why don't we sort of go around the Zoom room and let everybody just say hi. Uh, Tell us your film and just sort of say, tell us just some interesting thing about you or just, just sort of introduce yeah. yourself. So I don't really know. The thing is with a Zoom room, I don't know if the way I'm looking at it is how you're looking at us. I guess we'll have to call, I'll call on people. people. I'll call on people. Okay. Sophia, let's start with you. Oh, what an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Sophia. I directed, produced the short film Infinite While It Lasts. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I was here as well two years ago with another film. I really like the festival a lot. Um, yeah, it's really hot right now. I don't know if like if you can see the sweat coming all over my body, just like in Brazil, it's so so hot right now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, yes, yeah, it's good. It's great to be here. Great, thank you. And Aaliyah, I'm unmuted. Hi, my name is Aaliyah. Um, my film is Discovering Brooklyn. I'm in LA. Um, and an interesting fact about me, well, as far as Discovering Brooklyn is concerned, I was the writer, director, producer on that film. Mm -hmm. And like Sophia, m one of my films played in 2017, Inquiries played at Allen Film as yeah. well. So I too am excited to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks you. And I think, is it Ty? Tile, yeah. Tile. 
it's a weird name. My mom is a little hippie. Um, hi, I'm Tile. I um, wrote and directed and acted in my short called Home. Um, this was actually my first short. So it was my sort of like thesis project out of film school. So I'm super honored to get to be involved in your really great festival for my first one. So thank you so much. Yeah. Chad. Hi. Am I unmuted? I'm unmuted. Uh, hi, uh, Chad or no. uh, I've, I've had films in the festival before. I live here in Atlanta. I was supposed to direct the stage reading of uh, Perfect Arrangement, but some idiot decided to record it the night before the Emmys and nobody was available. So we're pushing it off into the fall. Um, and we're gonna re-record it as a benefit for Rainbow House and through Adam Film. And uh, I'm very excited. I uh, am off to New York next week to direct a, my, my big feature up there. Oh, so nice. I'm going to be in New York oh. for a couple of months. You want to talk about what you have coming up? Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, I uh, have a film uh, called Undertaker's Wife that should be coming out hopefully in December with uh, Shannon Sassman, John Brotherton, and Sarah Colonna. And um, I don't think I've told you this yet, Jim. Uh, and we, you were talking about Zooms. Like every, All of my friends are like so sick and tired of me like saying, hey, I'm doing a Zoom reading in my script. Can you hop on board? And they're like, oh God, they're so tired of me Zooming script readings. Um, but after I do The Intelligent in New York, I'm going to Palm Springs to shoot my next little, my, my next little uh, gay film. Uh, that's that wonderful SAG ultra low. Um, but it's gonna be installation, which I talked about years ago. Nice. And I don't know. We're finally getting it. Yeah, yeah, we're finally getting it made. Um, and we had the reading last week and it went really well. And I get to finally act again. So it's like, that'll be hey, fun. And Ben, Ben Bauer. Hi. Um, so good to be back. Uh, my name is Ben Bauer. I am the uh, writer, director, and uh, actor of uh, my short film, Yours, Mine, Ours. Uh, this was my first time directing, um, <laughs> which, you know, directing yourself as an actor when you're acting in every single scene is really hard. Uh, found that out, which was fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really exciting. Uh, I'm really happy with, you know, the, the final product. I, I, I personally think it turned out really well. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited to like be here and to have people watch it. Like there's, I, there's nothing like actually being able to watch it in a room with a group of people watching them react. But you know, the, the fact that people are going to be watching it, period, just really means the world to me. It's, it's why I do this, so. Nice. Was your lead actor very difficult to work with? Uh, horrible. I can't even tell you. <laughs> I, 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 I heard he was a complete diva. That's diva, what I heard. Like, always late to set, problematic, <laughs> wanted to rewrite everything, so. Yeah. Excellent. And Laquan. Hello. Um, this my short film is only for the night, and I'm the writer director. And this was my first short film as well. And also, this is my first Zoom festival, so this is my first time experiencing this whole thing. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Ours too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, first festival. <laughs> we're all we're all winging this. <laughs> we really are. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I'm going to apologize right away. Is it Tascada? Yes, 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 absolutely. You <laughs> got it right. <laughs> Not, no, it's, it's very, I'm glad you pronounced it perfectly fine, actually. Yeah. So not many people get it correctly. So I prefer that they use the uh, abbreviation PG, okay. uh, which yeah. is my initial so <laughs> for, for the ease of everyone. So I'm from, I'm Tathagata Ghosh. I'm from India, uh, Eastern India, actually, Kolkata. Um, wow. So this is the kind of cultural capital of the country. And uh, I'm the writer, director, and producer of the uh, short film, Miss Man, uh, which is playing in Around the World program. And I'm a huge uh, fan of this festival. And I know Jim for a while now, since last year. Um, and as you said, we have been corresponding a bit. But I'm so honored to be a part of uh, Out on Film, uh, 33rd year, and um, it's, a, it's a really a dream come true to play at this uh, festival. And uh, just to play with so many amazing filmmakers right now, the fact that we're doing it 
um it feels like i'm in the same room with you all so i'm really really honored congratulations yeah. to everyone of you for your films uh it's really it's really i'm i'm grateful and my film deals with love and acceptance it's actually based on a uh partly on a friend of mine who was uh, not accepted by his family when he came out to them a few years back and uh before 2018 september 6 september uh homosexuality was a crime in our country um though it has been decriminalized by the supreme court of india uh people still there is a taboo also so not many people are comfortable coming out now so when he came out his parents forcefully got him married uh which didn't end up well uh, we couldn't do much because we were not informed and so finally when um i came to know of it 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 really left me you know like i was shattered and i decided that i should share his story it took me a few years to get it everything right and to get myself in that correct state of mind to tell to make this film because it's really personal and then i got a wonderful cast and crew help me to put this film together so it has been a brilliantly cathartic journey and now to bring the film to a festival like out in film um i mean i cannot ask for more so really thank you thank you everyone for having me it means a lot to me it's our pleasure to have you here um and nicole hello everybody uh my name is nicole i'm from mexico i've uh, been living in la for the past 3 years i came to to do my masters program in the american film institute and l which is playing here and i directed and co Right, it is my thesis film, nice. and it's a um, it's a love story between two best friends in Southern California in the '90s, and um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Excellent. Nice. Recently, um, and Ashley. Hey, um, so um, I am. This is my first time at Out on Film, so I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, I've got family in Atlanta, so it was just nice. nice. To um be able to say yeah it's like in your neighborhood um and this is <laughs> my first short film um it's a musical queer film um representing an experience i had uh dating online dating as a bisexual latina so in uh you know new york so <laughs> um i'm just really excited to be here i'm really happy to you know see bisexual stories on film and see that they are being you know like flourishing in the queer community because there is like a lot of weird biphobia sometimes so i think it's really important to just like get out there um and to see representation because i think it really matters so thanks for having me i'm really happy to be here and in really good company with really good queer filmmakers this is this is a i have to say this is a kick ass zoom room I mean, all of you I, it's it's I'm honored that you all yeah. can be here thanks so much for joining us um and yeah. Tanya Kay Hi good morning i'm in hey. Los Angeles i'm Tanya Kay uh pretty early for me so it's a yeah. it's a filmmaker breakfast <laughs> um first time it, uh that I've had a film in out on films so I'm very excited I am impressed with how you guys are doing it um virtually it's a new landscape out there so I'm always I'm always watching like how are people pioneering how this is going to be done my film is coming out and it's a short short wow. and it's it's personal uh I wrote about um a dear friend of mine who her story uh, inspired this it's not exactly the same but she got a divorce and came out and she's a popular entertainer in her town so everybody knew and she started getting calls from younger in the scene uh women to kind of and they and to meet with her and the meetings always turned into how did you do it how did you get your divorce how did you and it's really an emotional an emotional ask it's not it's not a logistical ask it's an emotional ask but that's what it what my film is based on her story of that unique situation oh, yeah I <laughs> thank you for having me tell you i had to say i mean i i saw your film a while ago and i just sort of randomly go around the house to say own your shit jackie <laughs> own your shit <laughs> own your shit jackie <laughs> you all have exactly. so anyway um and javer 
Hi, I'm I'm Jovan. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, yes, I'm the co-director and co-writer of Buck. Um, this is my first time playing uh, out on out on film Atlanta, and it's also my first time uh, co-directing and co-writing a short film. Um, and I did it with one of my best friends and creative partners, uh, Elegance Bratton. This was part of my um, yeah. This is part of my thesis from uh, NYU, um, and so. Yeah, this base this follows a, a young black gay man's mental health crisis and his search for love and empathy on the streets of Baltimore City. Um, and we definitely wanted to, you know, speak to a lot of people who are dealing with mental health issues and are finding different ways to cope. Um, so great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Smaraki Mia. Yeah, hello. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm a first time filmmaker and I made a film Grace is a documentary sort of subject. And um, I'm really thrilled to be here at this film festival since it's a, a new for me and um, I'm really enjoying uh, the conversations. Okay, well, great. And Elegance. Hi everyone, I'm Elegance Braddon. I'm the co-writer, co-director of Buck uh, short film. This is my second out on film festival, my first short walk for me. Also, thank you. Um, it's really great to be back, and I've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, returning Buck into a TV show, and nice. Um, in pre-production on my first feature, on my feature debut, called The Inspection, which is being produced by Effie Brown, my partner Chester All Journal, and a lot of other things. So I'm really grateful for the support the Add On Film has given, so that I can have these opportunities. Thank you. But no, I got I got so Buck, where did uh where did where did I, I'm I'm sorry, where where did Buck premiere? Oh Buck premiered at Sundance this year. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. Last normal festival. Oh. <laughs> Last normal festival. We were in parties, drinking, coffee. And spreading spaces. those germs, just spreading the spread. <laughs> no hand sanitizer in sight. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I do want to welcome, I, I think I, did I get all, all of our filmmakers? I, I think I got everybody. And I did want to welcome um, David, who is one of our members. David, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or just wave. Um, and we have Brandy, who is joining us from Auburn, Alabama. Hey, Brandy. Hey, Brandy. Um, and I have someone on the phone, and I don't know who has dialed in. Oh, this is this is Mika Orr, the director and uh, writer of Duet. Oh, great! Excellent. Thanks well, so much for Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I I had to dial in. I'm not at home. I had to be outdoors. So, thanks for having me. Sure. Yeah. Um, I do kind of want to ask as as we look around this Zoom room, and, and I um, and, and I think it's something that that Ashley was was saying you know, the importance of representation. Um, and it's something that as we look at programming the festival, uh, that, that we really are committed to. Uh, one of the things that we, we always want to do is represent every aspect of, of our community um, and make sure that everyone has an opportunity to see themselves on screen. Um, and, and so I just, I'm curious to get some of your, um, views on that and, and the importance of representation in some in, in the work that you're doing well i'll start um for me like representation it's everything it's it's very important but it's not everything. i think a lot of times we end up kind of patting ourselves on the back for kind of how things look on the surface we don't really think, we don't look under the hood to see how those things actually function and the messages that are being communicated through the representation. So, you know, it's important, you know, that we see different people on screen. I don't want to undermine that. But at the same time, I think now that, I feel like that idea is pretty well lived in at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think now the next step is, you know, understanding the medium, the potential of this medium to, um, change hearts and minds to influence culture, to influence politics, and to understand that, especially for us as you know, queer filmmakers, to understand that that 
this medium has existed for about 120 some odd years. Oscar So White occurred in 2014. And I'm a big proponent of the, the intellectual Edward Said, who talks in on Orientalism, who talks about how art is another weapon in the tool of um, uh, the dominance of certain cultures in this world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to understand that, like, you know, now we've had six years of pushing back against 120 years of history. So for 120 years, people have gotten the same narrative over and over and over again. And that narrative has yielded the world that we live in today. So if we are to imagine a new world, then we must be really bold and audacious in how we use this medium to undermine what has already been done. Very well said. And, and, I, and I agree. I mean, I think it is, it is really important. I, I think that we do, that we go not just the surface and tell every aspect of those stories and let people tell those stories. And I'm curious for those of you who are outside of, of the US, how you respond to that. I'll ask you, Sophia. I've been a school teacher, I can call on people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thinking about what he said, yeah, it's just, um, I think it's the same situation that we have here where we have like more than 50% of the population is black, but 80% of characters on TV and films are white. So like, what's the, what's the logic in that? And now finally we have um, independent cinema that is changing things. Finally, like things are, are changing for the better, but like mainstream, in the mainstream uh, films is so, so much harder to still have, to have that representation um, and to try to explain to people the, important, the importance of having that. So it just feels like it's, a, it's something that I have been thinking a lot about, like how can we break in to, the, to, uh, to like the main media here in Brazil with representation while keeping um, whatever it is that's making things so mainstream. Because here mainstream is mostly comedies uh, so like how how can we do that uh, so like get the two words to combine because otherwise we uh, our independent cinema is still very much marginalized it only plays in like independent film festivals don't, like most people don't even know those films exist uh, so like is it, this is a, this is the thing that I have been thinking like how can we make the two words uh, finally combine uh, so we can get that representation to the mainstream because otherwise it's, it's it feels to me here that we still we, it's we still like queer cinema it's still stuck in a ghetto in a way you know mm -hmm. like we can't break through uh to, to a larger audience um so like yeah i don't have an answer it's just like just uh, sharing with you something that uh, i have been thinking about for many many years now and in trying to figure out like how, how we're gonna do it. Cause it feels to me like it's important, it's important for that to happen. Cause otherwise like queer, queer, um, uh, queer uh, youngsters, they don't have access to our films. They don't, know, they don't even know they exist. You know, like if it's not playing in a major cinema downtown, they're not, they're not gonna watch it. They're not gonna see themselves on the screen. So that's why for me, it's important to, to have that. Anybody else want to, any, any opinions about that or any thoughts? Um, I wanted to kind of throw in the, the idea of, it's not just about representation mattering like on screen, because I think that's ultra important, but um, I think it's also really important to get representation behind the camera. Um, because a lot of times what happens in the film industry, people turn to who they know, what they work with, the people who have the funds, and it ends up being a lot of white, cis, male filmmakers um, in all of the key positions. And so, um, to make sure that we're pushing, like even situations like this, where we have a bunch of writers and directors and even actors who are queer, like that's incredible. But then to also have um, like cinematographers and your producers and your PA and like everyone. Um, so I know like on, on my film, I wanted to make sure that we had that, which we did. And you, I think you can see the difference just in how um, much care and patience you put into actually making the film. You know, this, we're not just, 
we're not just here because it's our job and we just need to get this done. Like we're here because um, we're seeing ourselves and we're putting our work out there. Um, and it's, I think it's major to promote people to work in this industry um, that are queer. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I do. I think it is very important that we have in front of and behind the camera, everyone in the community. And I think that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, like this evolution of queer storytelling. Uh, you know, I, you know, we've been doing this now for about 11 or 12 years. And, you know, every year, the stories get more varied. Uh, the, the stories are broader. Uh, they're about everybody's experiences living as queer people. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you all see that, that same evolution. Um, as you've been telling stories or you're just starting to tell stories. Um, ben, I'm going to ask you. Um, I mean, okay, so when I made my first short film, uh, which is kind of like a romantic comedy, uh, the, the biggest impetus for me wanting to write this was because so many of the queer stories that I had been exposed to were, were wholesome coming out stories or like gross out comedy or stories about people dying and being punished for their sexuality. And, you know, I grew up watching, you know, romantic comedies of the 90s. So like, You've Got Mail, uh, Sleepless in Seattle. And I wanted to make something to... Sh to, to kind of show like a little bit more hope uh, in the gay experience that like you could have this like messy, funny, romantic thing and like not be punished for it. Um, so that's been really important for me in like all the films that I've made is that I, I, I want to show, you know, the, the gay experience as something like realer and messier and like where people aren't gonna be punished for their sexuality. Um, so that's, that's been like the thing that I have, I have been trying to do in, in my work. Yeah, I, I have a little, I can talk a little bit to this. I'm kind of jumping off what Elegant said with like art being a weapon. Um, whenever I was, I started as just an actor and kind of like what Ben was saying too, like it was just, I was playing, um, like the blonde girl's really sassy gay friend, or it was like a tragedy or, I mean, I've come out on every film I've ever been in and like, you know, I've always had the dad who hated it in the film, the mom loved it. I mean, it's been the whole thing, right? But it was like four stories that I was telling over and over and over again. And um, I'm from Oklahoma, but my grandparents, a lot of my family are from this really small town in Arkansas. And um, whenever I, um, after I came out and we went through that whole process, I talked to my grandpa a lot about like, um, what, like, who does he know who's queer? Like, what does he think about that? And he's like, well, I know you. I know there's that show, Will and Grace. Um, I know, you know, and he doesn't know any, like he, it, because the representation isn't out there and they're not able to see the art that just shows queer people living. Um, and so something that's really important to me is just like creating art that like just is the life of someone who happens to be queer and not these like best or worst days. Um, so yeah, I was think that was a really great point to talk about how art can be used as a weapon because I'd never heard that before. So you got me thinking. Nice. I wanted to say something to that point. Um, I grew up in New Jersey. My family, I'm a first generation Jamaican. And the story that I wrote um, was, I guess, paid homage to that. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to show the diversity of what it means to be Black, because Black is not monolithic, or the Black experience isn't. And um, with my first film, just like one of the other people's just said that my first film was a romantic comedy, but coming out to my family was not a comedy at all. <laughs> and I wanted to express that in um, Discovering Brooklyn and everything that I've written thus far, just because coming out for some people is a good experience and the gay experience is a great experience for some people, but for others it's not. Um, and like how they were saying in India, it was illegal um, to be gay or to be queer. The same thing is the case for Jamaica. And um, some people, again, are still struggling with that. So as far as my art being a weapon, I want to dismantle all of that and have people think and allow for people to see that we are more than just the stereotype. And um, 
with showing the realness of how people truly feel, I feel like we can, I, from my, my films, as far as that's concerned, we, we can, we can change that. Nice. I felt like for me, it's like that whole idea of the coming out narrative is something that I'm definitely pushing up against a bit because I think the, the move, the gay rights movement kind of like post, you know, HIV, right. Has been all, has kind of presented coming out as this zero sum game where you're winning if you're out and you're losing if you're in. And I think that for me as a black person, it's always been a bit more gray than that. That coming out is this, I'm coming out every day and I'm strategically deciding who I want to reveal that element of myself to and who I don't. And I don't think that makes me any less kind of politically valuable to the movement, although I felt invisible in that. And I think if you watch my films, even this one, Buck, you know, this is a character who is not necessarily like, you know, front and center at the gay pride parade, but is nonetheless a part of the community. So I think that in the future, this idea of like being out or in, I, I just think a bit more critical of a gay needs to be applied. Like, you know, that being able to be out in and of itself might be a sign of privilege. And that privilege can be damaging to people who don't have it. And I think that, you know, that nuance is something that needs to be incorporated so that this queer rights movement actually has meaning and purpose mm -hmm. beyond, um, you know, the kind of one dimensional binary presentation of like being out or in, you know, I, I think there's a lot more territory to be covered than, than those two polls. Nicole. Yeah, I agree. I think intersectionality is really important nowadays. It's not about being a woman or about being le a lesbian or about being gay or about being black. It's like you need to put all those elements together. In my case, uh, my film is sort of a love letter for my best friend and she struggled a lot to come out because Mexico is really close-minded and then her family also is Mexican and Lebanese so there's a lot of Muslims in her family and it's just you know it's not as easy for her to be like I'm just gonna be out with her mom it was really tough so she really struggled it was a very like it was an internal struggle that I wanted to portray in the film with like very you know little dialogue and more like sitting with the character um so yeah i think what again is mentioning is really important i, I wonder i wanted to for me i'm 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 old school and i'm old <laughs> this is the bottom line. Uh, but yeah i and i love seeing movies in a theater that, that's the way i grew up but, but i have to say you know with a virtual festival this year what i have really enjoyed is the opportunity to do things like this and have conversations with people that might not, I might not have had at the festival. It's refreshing to me to be able to, and, and I like the fact that because we are online, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our films and especially our short films can reach a wider audience. And to me, that's just so refreshing. Does anybody want to talk about that or have any opinions or just want to talk about that a little bit? I mean, was there, was there any, did any of you have any struggles with being in a festival, in festivals that are virtual? Well, I personally think it's pretty cool because um, anyone anywhere can watch our films. Yeah. And that wasn't an opportunity prior to the pandemic with in-person festivals. So I, there's, I mean, I miss, I miss cinema as well, but mm -hmm. I really like the opportunity for my fans across the nation and the world to be able to see the movies. Yeah, I just, I think it, was, it has been an amazing experience as well, but it feels like I'm missing, um, just trying to understand how many people actually watch the film. Because when you, you're in a festival and they're only gonna screen your film once, 
and you guess there are like a hundred seats in a cinema, maybe 200 seats. You can guess like maybe 200 people watched your film if the house was full or something like that. But like online, I really miss knowing the numbers. Like I really wish I could find out, especially because there were so many this year, like so many festivals uh, yeah. that screened my film online. But no one wants to give me the numbers. Like <laughs> they don't want to share it. And I'm just so frustrated, you know, because I think it would be an interesting um, an interesting data to have to understand like maybe we should have more international online festivals, you know. Yeah. Um, I think to add to Sophia, I would like to just mention that uh, she's abs absolutely right about that as much as I meet cinema halls, I mean, of course, uh, as Tony also said, that it gives opportunity to be to reach out to a lot of people worldwide. But of course, I mean, uh, I would like to echo what Sophia said that I would definitely like to know the numbers because I know for sure that 200 people are watching it through and through. I think what I also would like to know that how many people actually uh, finished watching my film? What is the completion rate of the film? Yeah. Like, are they watching just five minutes of the film or they're completing the whole 20 minutes or they're leaving it? So because that is very important. I think not only how many people watched my film, but how many people actually finished my film. Was it engaging enough to hold their attention throughout? Or was it, um, you know, like they dropped the film and they just moved on to the next one? So that is something I think these are these are this is one factor which really bothers me sometimes because um, you know, if it is if it is engaging enough, because then, of course, I mean, in a physical screening, if someone walks off uh, the theater in the middle of the screening, uh, then I can have a conversation with that person that what you didn't like about the film, take constructive feedback from that person and then incorporate in the future work. But here, that opportunity is not that definitely, but still, I at least try to engage in a conversation, be as much active in social media as possible and just to have feedback and, and to, to, you know, like to understand that what is the aspect that, the, that a particular audience member is not liking or what is they're loving or what is it. So I think completion rate is also something that I would like to add to what Sophia said. So I think that's also very important. Yeah, very that important. is so true because now that you said that, I remember that like not this year, I have had no feedback from anyone because of that, you know, like usually I'm, I'm, when I'm in the festival, I'm like talking to people, I'm seeing their faces, yeah. I'm like listening, people are laughing at the jokes, you know, like people walk past me and they say, oh, you know, like, oh, I like the film or whatever, you know, like even little things like that. And this year I have had nothing because like there is no, no comments, you know, like below the, the link of the film, they're like no, nothing, you know, like it just feels really, disheartening a little because we miss that experience of connecting to the public. I miss the free alcohol. I miss the free alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> <I> miss. Well. <laughs> and those and and filmmaker brunches. Yeah, <laughs> ours, ours are not very elaborate, but Lord, you go to frame, uh, frame line. I mean, frame line can, you can throw those filmmaker brunches They're inside out. You know, so anyway. but, the, but the industry tie in is the thing I think that's, most unfortunate like i you know i like seeing i don't know i mean to me i think the streaming thing is the thing anyway for all of the i think every other element of the film business has been impacted by streaming so why wouldn't festivals be inter impacted kind of think covid kind of made something happen quicker that was almost eventual personally but the thing i miss is the industry side of it like you can yeah. you get some free food and some free liquor and then you meet this person who works at that place who works with this person at that other place and then i don't think i'd have my film my work would be as far along as it is if it wasn't for that aspect of the festivals and I, that part i feel bad for those coming after us because it's like you know you could have a huge impact you could play all the top tier festivals and it's only online and, and if you're not it's just harder for me to do the work in this space than it is when i'm on the ground at one of these things you know I will say, though, um, I was worried when we started getting into festivals that uh, how is I going to be able to afford going to all these places? How is I going to create the time and the schedule and also work my job because I need to support myself? Um, but this has given me the opportunity at least to see it screen in all of these amazing places without worrying about like flying to all these other, you know, states and um, 
like actually being able to fully promote and like push the push the sort of social media to like get all of our supporters in each of those places to watch it. So that has actually been kind of helpful, especially since, you know, things are great right now with the job industry um, that I can work and also like see the film play virtually in all these places. So that's been a, sort of a plus for me. Sure. Well, I, I have a, I have a follow-up to that. I mean, um, and you know, from, from the festival in, we're, we're learning, we're still learning how to do a virtual festival. And it's, it's been a, a pivot that has taken a lot of time. We're still learning the ropes. I mean, there's just surprises here and there that you didn't expect. But what can we as festivals do, you know, to help you or, or, or to, what can we do as festivals to really enhance or help you as filmmakers? I think um, that's that's very important question, Jim. I'd just like to uh, say that um, I, as much as I'm enjoying the virtual festivals, as I just said, I think I would love to see a film market also, as we see, um, you know, in, in in certain festivals like, you know, like we have in Cannes or or Berlin, we have the European film markets or the market section because what really sometimes we struggle with is finding distribution. Uh, though there are OTTs in, in our country as well or abroad, definitely, um, who are interested. Sometimes they watch it. And I have got invitations for my film for a, f a few festivals where I didn't also send my film to. Probably they saw it at, at a festival and they scouted the film and they approached me. Uh, but I think I would love to see a market section because I think a festival, especially like Out on Film, which is so prestigious, um, I, I'm sure sales agents or distributors or are, 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 are scouting people from different OTTs can throng there to, to, to select films to, uh, for their platforms to give them a platform uh, to, to, to host the film. So I think film market is definitely something that I would love to see market section in, in the festival where I can have a word with uh, an engaged conversation with, with sales agents and distributors or find future producers for my future projects. Because I think for me, which is happening very much in India as well, uh, we are having co-productions, international co-productions. So even if I don't find a distribution, I can definitely find a platform for future co-productions between two countries, like an India-America um, co-production or an India-Italy co-production or whatever it is. So I think that's that's these are these are these aspects are something that I would love to see um, in any festival, be it virtual or physical, as a matter of fact. So yeah, good point. Um, I have an idea. I don't know how this would be accomplished, but uh, so let's, you know, at award season, when you're in the union, they'd send out these screeners yeah. and key people, at least in Los Angeles, key people that could get you jobs in the future um, will see those screeners if they take the time to watch them. And this being virtual, it doesn't cost any money to print up screeners. So it'd be neat to see that the festival had a list of specific target, you know, key people in different markets that were receiving a free complimentary screener to blocks or maybe the whole festival. That'd be cool. I mean, I say we can do that. <laughs> um... Yes. I, I was going to mention maybe something in the style of just something where it does create, I think a lot of these virtual festivals, um, it's kind of a good thing that like people can kind of pop in and watch like when they want to. Um, so it's sort of like, oh, the film will be available from this time to this time. But if it was sort of more like, i.e. like Netflix party or scener where it's sort of like a, a screening party showcase where there is a comment section at the same time. So everyone is watching at the same time. And yeah. then there's a comment section that might sort of at least recreate the feeling of all of us watching in one space. Real time. Good point. I wish we could be funneled, like from where I was at 2017 to where I'm at now, I think the, the biggest difference now is that I'm having conversations with the finance side of the industry um, more than I ever have before. And, and I think, you know, playing Sundance, you're my shot, playing Sundance um, kind of helped with that because they're there and at Sundance. And a lot of times when I play the queer film festival circuit, it just feels like, or even the black film festival circuit, anything that's not that like Sundance can kind of level, people just seem very resigned to the fact that this isn't necessarily about the business here. 
This is about lifting up voices. This is about, uh, you know, audience and all of that. And all of that is totally necessary. But I think, um, you know, what I, what I've come to realize in financing my first feature is there's a lot, like, I'll, I'll just give you an anecdote. When I was at Tish, we had this producing teacher, Bob Nixon, rest his soul, who gave us a lesson, right? He's done, I think something like 300 films or something like that. And he was like, so you guys want to make your first feature, right? Well, when I made my first feature, there were 400 companies and I had the writer write a script that I really, really believed in. And I went out to every company until somebody said yes and nobody said yes. And then I went out to a bunch of dentists and doctors and they all put in 20,000, 50,000, whatever. And together they raised, we raised the million that made the first feature. And this guy is like, you know, Oscar nominated and gone on to do amazing things. And I think that like to make these films, especially these kind of smaller queer indie films, there is a, a financier class of people who care about these types of movies. And I wish that the queer film festivals were a bit more aggressive in um, curating time with those people. Um, because I think if that were to happen, then the kind of disconnect between, I, I, I mean, I've, I've been in queer film festivals now for like three years. There's so many movies. It's just unending, the amount of films. Yet when you go to Netflix or you go to Hulu or you go to Amazon or whatever, you don't see these films on those platforms. And I think maybe kind of filling that gap, being more aggressive and intentional about filling that, that, that gap would be really helpful so people can have careers doing this. So they don't have to do, you know, 10 other things besides the thing that they actually aspire to do, you know, cause meanwhile, the straight white guys have that kind of support and, you know, they're not doing the stuff that we're doing to survive, <laughs> you know. Let me, can I just say something right quick? I mean, everybody who knows me knows that I, I love short films and, and my board is always ready to beat me over the head because I'm always like trying to create another shorts program seeing where <laughs> I can fit this. There, oh, my board has always met me. And that would be me. That, <laughs> yes, he can, he can attest to that. But, you know, for me, you know, you, you see these great short films, you see them at a festival and, you know, and then I just wonder where those films are going to be three years, where people can see those. I, I wish hmm. there were, what was, you know, like a Netflix for short films. Are there just some way all these short films could mm -hmm. fit somewhere where people could see them? And, and I mean, what do you, what are your ideas for that? Because I just, as I said, I love the short films that we show. I just wish that there could be available for someplace, someplace in the future. I think, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. No, no, please, please, Nicole, go ahead. I was just gonna say I've been I've been in a, some festivals that that have been doing a good job with industry panels. That it's sort of a little bit what Gans has been saying, like they invite HBO people, you know, Sundance people, like a little bit of everything. Initiative people. Overall, I think the festivals that have been done it the most are uh, festivals for Latin. Latinx filmmakers, so they want these companies to include this content. And you have sort of like a closer conversation, uh, sort of even pitch your projects a little bit. And if they're interested, they reach out. And it's ha it has happened um, because a lot of these companies do wanna be more inclusive. Uh, so maybe, you know, that can happen also with LGBTQ films and, um, yeah, I think it's like an opportunity, even through Zoom, there's a lot of these people that normally won't go, or won't fly to, to the festivals, but through Zoom, it's an opportunity for them to just sit with their morning coffee, you know, in their desk and be like, we've had talks with like high, high top people about financing, about opportunities, and they're really open to, to give the chance, you know? So I think it's the time to, to sort of embrace these zoom thing and if we can't be all together and we can't be networking in person we just take that opportunity to connect with people that normally wouldn't do it in person i don't know it's my two cents chad sorry okay sorry um 
I'm going into this big, uh, so I have a feature that I'm doing in New York, which is not, you know, it's a thriller. But then I'm going to San Francisco, uh, Palm Springs to do my, my, my little gay film, as we call it. You know, that, that $200,000, $300,000 little gay, little gay film. And of course, as you all know, trying to get that $200,000, $300,000 is a pain in the ass because you want to make sure that your investor is going to make their money back. And you want to make sure that it, you know, it makes some money, that it goes somewhere, that it ends up on a Netflix or a Hulu. And, and then sometimes we've all seen these movies that like suddenly show up on our, on Netflix and you're like, how the hell did that movie get on there? And uh, so my question for you guys is one, when you're looking at a film like that, now not beyond shorts, because I, I've done the shorts and, and you know, tried to, I, my, one of my films had a distributor, terrible distributor, let's just look up my last film, don't go with them. Um, lost, lost thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and uh, my question for you guys is, as we're trying to move these conversations forward, as we're trying to like move, uh, we're trying to get more visibility of gay actors being seen, and then you, you go out to those name gay actors, the ones that, you know, not, I'm not talking like Matt Bomer, but more like, like a Charlie Carver, or like somebody who's kind of along that possibly gettable thing, but then they're like, I don't want to do a gay film which is that frustrating part of like, now, now how is the value of my movie going to happen? Because we're having this conversation right now on installation. It's like, we have to have like some sort of name value in that, in that thing. And that's a $200,000 project, but then add COVID to that, which is like a huge, I don't know how many people, has anybody shot anything? Raise your hand if you have, if you shot during COVID, Tanya and Elegance. So it's so frustrating because like the COVID cost for my New York film is $100,000. Like I could shoot half of a movie for that, that amount of money. So my, I don't know what my question is. My question is, where do you guys see us? How do you see, uh, hmm, how do you see us con, uh, expressing the value of our projects as we're moving forward in post COVID times? When you're going to an investor and you're like, I need $200,000, I need, need $50,000, whatever it is. How do you see this moving forward in COVID times with your stories? I'm sorry, this question made no fucking sense. Um, uh, how, how, does, how do you see moving forward post COVID in our, in our filmmaking, whether it be shorts uh, or a feature? Especially you LA people and New York people. And, and, and of course uh, the, the Brazilians as well. I, uh, but I'm especially curious like here in our our, our, our country where no one seems to give a shit about COVID. <laughs> one, one of uh, these people I was talking about, uh, studio people was saying that unfortunately with the COVID situation, I mean, I don't know if this is gonna answer your question, but I thought it was interesting because of the cost you're mentioning, like a micro budget film or a small budget film that would normally, you know, they will finance for like 3 million to 5 million they're pushing that because just COVID, you know, budget is like two million for like a movie. It's just very expensive. So it's almost like you said, twice like of what the movie will cost. So they're just not financing that right now. They're just doing the big budget things because, you know, it's such a big budget that the COVID cost is so small. So it's kind of sad because, you know, all of indie films and, and films we would love to have them finance are not gonna, they're not gonna support them up until this is over. How often, how soon do you guys see yourself working again? Or and I know, like Elegance and Tiny, you guys have been doing support, but how, how soon do you think that you'll be able to just, like go back to work? And, and like for a festival for next year, do you see that happening? I, I don't, actually don't see that happening for like a year or two more. To be, to be very frank. Um, I mean, if you look at how long the Spanish flu lasted, the Spanish flu, like, um, and just with how our country is handling it, we don't even know. I mean, maybe things will change if we potentially see some changes uh, during election month. Um, but, you know, there's just so much up in the air. And with how, where we are right now, numbers are starting to go up. Um, I don't think that, especially in the idea of production and COVID costs, they're not going to be eliminated, I think, for at least a year or two. Um, I think that we will still be thinking about COVID and sanitation and such um, for the next few years. 
which I mean, if you think about it, I don't think it's a terrible thing. I mean, think of how common it was for people to be on set and just say, oh, I, I'm just getting over a cold. You know, I just have a cold. I just have a little bit of this. Like, that, if you think about that now, it's totally bananas. Like, you, you, if you're sick, you shouldn't be there. So, um, to be honest, I don't think that we're going to be over it for a year or two. I don't know. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say really quick, um, with the whole COVID situation, I've definitely let like the realities of, of, you know, everything kind of dictate what I've been working on. So like this next project that I'm working on is it's, you know, three actors can be done with like minimal crew in one location. And it's, you know, I've, I've just started trying to like, think about how to work around it. So not to do like these big budget things with like a ton of actors that you'll need a ton of, uh, a ton of crew on. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to shoot something in November, but you know, as far as I know, the producers are still gung ho to like shoot it, but it's like a big thing with like a lot of people. And yeah. I just don't see how it's actually going to be possible. So I'm not really holding my breath, but yeah. So hopefully, hopefully soon. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm shooting a movie right now, um, a documentary. With uh, we were, we we next Friday we begin a road trip, an 11 day shoot trip where we'll be driving from Boston to North Carolina to Florida. Um, just me, the producer, and um, our driver, and then when we get to, to each town, we'll be hiring necessary crew from those towns. Um, and then I go on to my feature, I think <laughs> right now we're scheduled to shoot in February. Uh, we'll be spending, but it'll be a sleepaway camp situation. Everybody will be tested. Everybody will be, once you get there, we live there. There's no, you know, we, 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 we move together or we don't move at all kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, but at the same time, you know, like the Spanish flu came along in 1918 and by 1919, there were hit movies still. So, you know, I think at a certain point, you know, some of us, we don't eat if we don't work. So we're going to have to work. I think as we're kind of coming up at the end of our time. I do want to, before anybody else has to leave, Josh is going to take a, a selfie <laughs> yeah. um, from all of us. Um, so, Josh, if you're ready. Yeah. I'm sure no one's ever done a Zoom selfie before. It's like all the rage now, but we're just going to go. <laughs> we're going to go three, two, one. We're going to smile and say cheese, and we're going to take a screenshot. So, everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. All right. Three, two, one. Awesome. Thank Excellent. you, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you all so much for doing this. I mean, again, we just came up with this idea a couple of days ago. I, I, I really like the idea. We might try to do something else next weekend. A lot of this is just literally we're winging it and we're sort of inventing stuff as we go along. <laughs> but thank you all for being receptive to this. It was great seeing and talking to you all. And I hope there will be more of this. And I, and I, I personally, I'm not sure where we're going to be next year, but I do think that the virtual element is going to be have to have to be something that is with festivals from here on out. I just think that that's something that um, the positives are just, for me, just too positive. I mean, I mean, you know. And and really from all of us here at, at the film festivals um, and, and all of the programmers, we're in a queer programmers group. Um, thank you yeah. for telling your stories um, sure and, and bringing them to us that we can share with our audiences. Um, I mean, we've listened to you over the years. We know how hard it is to get this done yeah. um, and everything that you all put into it. Um, and this year, making it even harder and going forward. So, you know, there's a part of this where I just want to thank you for your perseverance. Yeah. Um, and thank you for using art as a weapon and for telling stories and for helping people to find themselves in this world. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you everyone. everybody. So thank you all for joining us. Appreciate it. We'll thank, be you so thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Craig and yeah. James. Bye. Thank you. Bye.